This is Brutus, a fearless muskox that left his herd and embarked on a three-year journey around Sweden that defied the odds and made him famous. An arctic giant, desperately searching for love, for a new mate and a place to call home, but without knowing that there simply were no others out there. He was a wonder, doomed to roam the empty wilderness alone. The story of Brutus and his misadventures is only a small part of the bigger picture that is the return of this animal to Scandinavia. And somehow here at Mossy Earth we've gotten tangled up with the fate of this fascinating arctic animal. And that is why in this video today I'm here in the north of Sweden to take you to meet Brutus, to meet the people that got to know him along his journey, but crucially to gather your ideas, to ask for your help, your, your ingenuity on how we could go about saving this fragile Swedish herd. But I think that together we can do something about it. Welcome to the Muskox Saga. My journey has taken me to the north of Sweden to meet some amazing people who got to know Brutus on his wanderings and are trying to help save the wild muskox herd. But before we get into all of that, let's start from the beginning by defining what a muskox is, but crucially, what it isn't. You see, contrary to their name, the muskox is not that closely related to ox or to bison. It's true that all of these animals are part of the bovidae family, but while cows and bison are part of the bovinae subfamily, the muskox is part of the caprinae subfamily, which means it is less of a hairy cow and more of a large hairy goat. In fact, their closest living relatives are four species of goro, which are goat-like creatures living in Asia. And the more you look at a muskox, the more goat or sheep signs you find, from the hardness of their hooves to their laterally growing horns. So after learning this fact, I expected to see sort of a goat-sized animal, but when I got to see them for the first time, yeah, I can totally relate to the person that called this animal an ox, because they are quite large. At one point, their natural range spanned the Arctic, but the last muskox remains found in Europe are dated to around 9,000 years ago. This means that the muskox was in all likelihood hunted to extinction, much like most of the other megafauna that lived here during that period. However, the ones in Greenland and in North America managed to survive to the present day, and since then, successive reintroductions have returned them to these areas in North America, Greenland and Russia. But our story will focus on Scandinavia. The question of whether one should consider bringing muskox back here is a tough one to answer in 2023, with all the knowledge that we have on how to do these things. But of course, in the 20th century, they did it, you know, anyway. They had no feasibility studies, no social studies, they never consulted the local population. And this sounds quite liberating, you know, just get on and do things. But ultimately, I think this led to a botched reintroduction. And I think it's the root of all the problems that this species faces in Scandinavia. To properly retell the history of the Scandinavian muskox, I'll be using this report written by Mats Eriksson, about the potential future of the muskox in Sweden. And of course, it's in Swedish, but I Google translated it and I dropped both versions in the description for you to read. Our story begins in 1900, when two calves from East Greenland were relocated to Norrbotten in Sweden and four to Tromsø in Norway, before ending up in Jamtland, Sweden. And by 1904, all of them were dead. Jump to 1931, and 10 muskoxen were introduced to Doverfjell, reproducing successfully but not surviving past the war. Then, in 1948, eight calves were introduced in Tromsø County, Norway, and they roamed as far as Vitangi and Paraka in Sweden, and these are believed to have gone extinct in the 60s, with no breeding reported. But around the same period, between 1947 and 1953, 27 calves were sent to Doverfjell in a larger initiative. Only about 10 or 11 were left by 1953, and they formed the basis of today's Norwegian population of more than 250 individuals. However, despite growing in number, this group suffers from a lack of genetic diversity, which might be a risk for its long-term survival. The tale of the Swedish herd began in 1971, when two cows, a bull and two calves, ventured to Harjedalen in Sweden. The small group settled there and grew in number, 
reaching a bit over 30 animals by 1985. This number then started to decline rapidly, and the causes were not immediately clear, but one of them was thought to have been further inbreed. To help mitigate this, a cow named Sophie was tranquilized and brought to a zoo in Yarvshu, where she made it with Piterak, a Greenlandic muskox. She was then added back into the herd, where she gave birth to Piterak Jr., who later fathered many cows. This means that the Swedish herd might be struggling, but it now has a better DNA mix than the 250 Norwegian muskox. The other cause for this severe decline was thought to have been disturbance by visitors and guided tours. The thinking goes that even a small disturbance could lead to a significant waste of energy that the muskox desperately needed to survive, and the first thing they cut back on was mating. So after all of these misadventures, we finally get to 2018, when a young bull called Brutus decided to write his name into this saga. He left his herd and started showing up in all sorts of places, and in the process he gained a small following online, with all sorts of headlines popping up. Until one day, he showed up at Matt's and Karen's house. They are two ecologists with a true passion for nature. In the past, they've worked hard to help bring back Arctic foxes, they ran the Wolf Symposium for 25 years, and these days they help create wonderful information boards and nature exhibitions for various nature areas in Sweden and Norway. And they live up here in Jamtland, not too far from the wild muskox herd in Harjadal. In this past winter, I was nearby and had the chance to pay them a visit to hear all of their amazing stories. And then they casually mentioned that they'd had a muskox there. And I simply couldn't believe it because I actually had heard and read about Brutus before in some old Atlas Obscura article, I believe. And it just felt like such a funny coincidence that he'd been right there at their doorstep. So this summer, I decided to take the long train ride up again and go dig a bit deeper. And he actually was very, very close to our house here, much closer than I'm now. And he, and that first time he came here, that was 2019, if I remember right. And he came every year at this time of the year in uh, May, early June, and uh, then he disappeared. And sometimes he came back later in the summer, but sometimes he just moved somewhere else. And he kept coming back here for three years. So 19, 20 and 21, he came back and visited us. The only damage they suffered over the years was this broken mailbox. And there was also a neighbor who had a broken fence. But it seems that in other places he caused a bit more damage, although nothing too serious, as you can see from this post from the radio station in Jantlands. Well, Brutus isn't the sharpest tool in the shed. But I like to think that he still had some good intuition showing up here, because in the past, Mats has traveled Greenland extensively and seen plenty of muskox, and more recently, he was involved in the capture and return of Sophie to bring new DNA to the wild herd. So me and Mats decided to go on a road trip to see Brutus, of course, but crucially to understand better what Mossy Earth and you, the viewer, can do for this wild muskox herd. Now, at this point, you might be wondering if there's anything that can be done for this herd. And don't worry, at the end of this video, I intend to fully explain this idea. But right now, I just wanted to remind you that the only reason we can do anything at all, and the only reason we can do all of our really amazing rewilding projects, is because of people like you watching this video that decide to go to mossy.earth and contribute to our work with a monthly contribution. And if that feels like a really big step for you right now, then please consider subscribing and turning the bell on. The algorithm is really important for us. It's what allows us to get attention, to reach more people and to do these kinds of projects. Now, let's go meet Brutus. These days, he is easier to find because on the 23rd of August, 2021, he was tranquilized and brought to the Muskox Center. Now, I know what you're thinking. Why not just let him be? Well, he was found in a school and in other public places, and the police was going to have to put him down because the Swedish Environmental Protection Agency doesn't recognize the muskox as a Swedish animal. And as such, it doesn't have any protocols in place on how to deal with them. As this newspaper put it, he has fallen between the chairs of different institutions. So to avoid having to shoot Brutus, the police called up the center to go pick him up, and they got the job done. And this is where Ida comes into our story. 
she's the one that takes care of the muskox here. So I asked her what she made of the whole Brutus situation. It's the, the instinct for a muskox bull, he needs to mate. Uh, he has, if you could guess, lost the fight in the wild herd uh, by stonging together 60 km per hour and ones that are able to do that the most times, he's the strongest one. And the losing ones, they will start to walk and search for a new herd. And in Sweden, if you search for a muskox herd, you will find cows and, and sheep and <laughs> farms with animals because we have so few of the, of the muskoxes. So when he waked up, uh, woke, woke up here uh, and we just serve him uh, some, couple of, uh, some, some cows, I would say he has a good life. He will mate until he, he doesn't want to mate anymore. <laughs> <laughs> there must be like a, a strange uh, hangover, you know, he goes yeah. to sleep and then he wakes up and he's like... Oh, I feel a bit dizzy, but oh, hey, look at this beautiful woman. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Life of, uh, for Brutus. But Ida doesn't really want to see more muskox in here, because this place is primarily set up to help the wild herd. Muskox, muskox Center is like a rescue program. We want people to come here and have a good experience of the permission of the animals instead of disturbing them in the wild. Um, so we. By coming here, we give peace and calm in the wild, and we also have dreams and goals to have our calves that's born in here as wild as possible. So they could move out into the wild and be one, a new member in the, the wild herd. So a mix between a, essentially a, a breeding facility in some ways and also a way to remove the disturbance from the wild. Exactly. That's brilliant. Ida and the whole center feel like they strike the right balance here. They allow visitors, but they're clearly not a zoo. After all, they only have a single species, and the muskox are not forced on display, because any visitors need to be accompanied by a guide, and they can only ever go on this platform here. The muskox can simply stay at the back of the enclosure and avoid people, but this time we were granted an exception, to go and meet Brutus. So Mats, are you uh, excited to see Brutus again? Yes, I'm looking forward to see Brutus again. Your old friend. <laughs> My old friend, yes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you know, having a good time. The muskox were quite shy initially, which is actually a really great sign that they haven't lost this trait, as it will be important if any of these calves return to the wild further down the line. So the biggest one in front is, is Brutus, <laughs> the missing one. Mm. You recognize him, Matt? Oh, yes, <laughs> of course. He's <laughs> your friend. He's my friend. Do you think he so, recognizes you? No, I don't. I don't know. Let's see if he comes. <laughs> <laughs> Seeing Brutus was really cool. After all, it's quite rare for an animal to be this famous, but this one certainly is. And he's also the last link in a chain that goes back all the way to a strange reintroduction from Greenland. So, he's a bit of rewilding history, if you will. It's nice to see him again. They're so calm. And then we got an even nicer treat. I mean, look at this ridiculously cute and fluffy calf. Her name is Brusa. She is the child of Brutus. It seems that he succeeded in his mission after all, even if it wasn't how he thought it would go. For my part, I was offered a small souvenir that certainly was a strange one to bring back home. Okay, so that is a bit of a uh, strange souvenir to keep. It'll look a little bit weird on the, on the mantelpiece, but uh, I think it's pretty cool. It's uh, a little bit of, uh, of Brutus or some other Swedish muskox. Um, so it's a cool memory. Okay, so it's been a couple of months now, and I think it's time we start figuring out what we can do to help this herd. And I think we first have to define what the problem is. And from an ecological perspective, it's very clear. They have a very low population number and very low genetic diversity. But the ultimate issue that doesn't allow this to improve is that they exist in some form of political vacuum that comes with all sorts of negative consequences. The animals live deep in a protected area, where monitoring is hard, but no helicopter or snowmobile access is allowed, because the muskox are not acknowledged to be a Swedish species, so there are no exceptions for 
any permissions to go do this kind of work. This means that it's hard to even count them every year, let alone do any kind of direct management, such as introducing some calves to the wild herd to help boost their genetic diversity and improve their population numbers. And all of this despite there being a private entity, this Muskox Center, that is willing to do this at their own expense. I mean, it's baffling. Then, the next issue that we face is best exemplified by our uh, friend Brutus here. Wandering bulls happen frequently here, and they might come into contact with farmers or anyone else going about their daily life. This includes the Sami and their reindeer herds that could be negatively affected by the muskox. So there needs to be a proper compensation scheme in place for all of this. It won't be costly, and it is absolutely necessary to ensure the herd's coexistence with the human landscape. And before you think that this is a really big ask, please consider that there are 400,000 moose in Sweden and 250,000 reindeer. There should be enough space for a few small herds of muskogs in the mountains. Like, it has to be possible. And I think all of this can start with two actions. And you can help with both. So the first action that we have is to shine a spotlight on the muskox and start a conversation about them. And what you're seeing here, this video, is our contribution to this. We've decided to make it to help try and shine a spotlight on this neglected herd. And for your part, what you could really do is go in the comment section and let us know how do you think this problem should be addressed. We've often asked questions to the uh, hive mind of YouTube, to the collective brain of the viewers of the Mossy Earth channel, and it's been quite useful and insightful. So that would be the first action. It's a very simple one. And in addition to that, you could also share this video or essentially talk to people about muskox like, hey, this is a species that lives here in Sweden and it's absolutely neglected. It's a really good topic for, you know, a night out or, a, you know, <laughs> a good dinner table topic. Um, but yeah, this part is, is the simple one. Then the second action gets into the nitty gritty of this problem. We need to get the Swedish EPA on board. We need them to acknowledge that the muskox is a Swedish species. And when there's a lot of discussion and things are confusing, here at Mossy Earth, we believe that data and research really bring some form of calm and clarity. We need literature reviews on what research is out there to identify gaps. We need to understand how countries with muskox populations manage them and how to do this well. We need to understand how muskox use the landscape, how they affect vegetation, what their function is in the ecosystem, how they change habitat structure, what their effect is on other biota, how they affect invasive species, and crucially, how their feeding behavior competes with reindeer in the forest in the summer or the mountaintops in the winter, so that we understand how this could affect the Sami herders, among many other such questions. And this is where you can come in again, because we think that a lot of these questions could be answered by a master thesis or even potentially a PhD topic. So we've put a form in the description of this YouTube video where you can sign up both as a supervisor or as a student. And this is quite a shot in the dark for us. We're not a research organization, but we're trying to use our reach to essentially get a conversation started and potentially get some of this research started to start answering some of these really important questions. And if one of them proves to be particularly valuable or fruitful in its research, then we're happy to try to help fund it as well, because it might lead to a potential intervention on the ground and an improvement in the herd's situation. And we think that's really worthwhile. And I think now it feels appropriate to leave you with the words of Mutz, who after all is a Swede who cares about nature and the state of his country and has taken good care of the land all of his life. For me personally, I would love to have uh, a bigger muskox herd in, in the Swedish mountains. And I think if we just learn to live with them and uh, just find a way to, to do that, uh, and it's easy, they are easy to live together with, then I, I, I think that would, could be possible. And it would be a better place to live? Yep. For me. <laughs> For me too. <laughs> yeah.